Welcome to Three Devs and a Maybe, the podcast series for beginner web developers and general web enthusiasts. Now, introducing your show hosts, Michael Budd, Fraser Hart, Lewis Keynes, and Ed Mann. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Three Devs and a Maybe. I am joined by my co-host, Ed Mann. Hello. And we have a special guest again this week in the form of James Watts. How are you doing, James? Hey, guys. Hey, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Sure, no problem. Uh, so I'm trying to think where we should kick off. Uh, I guess, uh, without going into too much about, uh, all the, the kind of open source projects you've been involved with and everything, but just a little bit of a background for you, if, if you don't mind, James. Sure. Um, so like I said, my name's uh, James Watts. Uh, I'm 30 years old. Uh, I like long walks on the beach. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I'm British, uh, originally from Portsmouth. I hey. uh, now live in Spain uh, with my wife, and we've got a little one on the way, just like yourself. Aww. Yeah. Is that your first? Uh, yeah, this is our first. So this is probably the most serious project in my life so far. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. How are you feeling about it? Um, it gets more real every day. Yes. You know, every every day you realize, you know, okay, there's there's no way to backtrack this. You know, this is this is going whether you like it or not. You can't revert. Get revert. Get revert. You know, there's no revert. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> undo, undo. <laughs> no, yeah. no. I mean, we're no seriousness. I mean, we we were serious about it, so it wasn't like a surprise or anything. You know, we, yeah, we were yeah. going for it. Um, but you know, it's uh, it does put things into perspective. Yeah, like you say, even though you've planned for it, it's still a massive shock when it happens, and. uh and it sounds really cliche, but it does change your life. Like, you know, okay, the baby's not even been born yet, but you do realize that suddenly now yeah, you, your whole world doesn't revolve around you anymore or you, you know, you and your friends or you've now got this central thing that you've produced and you, right. And you realize things you never knew, like yeah. the cost of prams and cots. Yes. It's just like ridiculous. It is. It really is crazy, isn't it? It's, uh, it's You're really selling this game. to me. You're selling this whole baby <laughs> thing to me. I'm sorry. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a core member of the uh, Cake PHP project. Um, yep. I'm also the organizer of Cake Fest, uh, which is the annual uh, PHP conference. Uh, I've been mostly involved in enterprise PHP development, um, and I'm currently acting director of the Cake Development Corporation, uh, which is also known as Cake DC. Uh, which is more or less the, the commercial entity behind the framework. How did you get involved in programming? I've been programming since I was like three or four years old. I mean, not, not doing anything serious back then. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, playing around on the home PC, uh, stuff like that. Um, I can't remember if it was eight inch or, or five and a quarter inch, but you know, those huge floppy disks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I had that as well. Yeah. Good old days. Um, yeah. mostly DOS stuff. So, yeah. uh, and, and usually with the objective of getting a game to work or something like that. Yes. Uh, you know, the Space Invaders for the win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and then I started, I got into, uh, uh QBasic, uh, which is uh, basically, a, a ramification of the basic language. So basically, you know, procedural hell. Um, yeah. so go to, he's using go to run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you knew nothing back then. So, you know, that was programming. That was, you know, programming 101. Um, and then I, I got into stuff like, um, mostly out of recreational. I got into like, uh, doing Doom mods and stuff like that. And then I played around with, uh, the J Doom engine, uh, which was kind of when they started integrating stuff from the Quake engine into Doom. Um, so that's more or less where I start learning about, you know, vectors and, you know, more about the, the mathematical side of things, not just painting something on the screen. Um, then I stumbled across HTML. At around uh, 14 or 15, I think I was. Yeah. Uh, guy showed me how to create web pages and, you know, I just played around with it. Um, you know, the markup is really easy to get into, you know, because the result is immediate. So, you know, it's something that's really good to, you know, start out with. Um, but this was way before CSS. You know, I'm talking like the IE three days. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> you know, the dark days of the web. Yeah. Tables, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I built websites in, in, in tables. I'm, I'm ashamed. Yeah. I think we all um, did. Yeah. I still do. I don't know what's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> what you say? CSS. What is that? You're bringing it back. Definitely. <laughs> right. Awesome. Then I, then I got into CSS, you know, with IE4 and IE5 when it started, you know, to really get pushed. 
Yeah. Um, and then you kind of get into JavaScript, you know, because basically you want to do stuff on the screen. But I mean, yeah. that was like, uh, that wasn't JavaScript. I mean, that was IE, so it was JScript or JScript, VB script, JScript, all that yeah. fun stuff. Yep. Real, real proprietary crap. <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> uh, then you start playing around with the DOM, uh, you know, making stuff move around on the browser. You know, awesome stuff, you know, when you know nothing about the cross browser compatibility hell, which is, you know, waiting everybody. Um, and then I discovered, uh, PHP. I can't remember how long ago that was. I think it was PHP 3. Um, I didn't do much because I didn't have a server back then. I didn't really understand how all the architecture works. I was just, you know, mucking around on, on local computer. But I remember you had, uh, Phil Sturgeon on and, yeah. uh, he, he said, uh, that, you know, he discovered, you know, with PHP really early on the basic CMSing. Yeah, uh, you know, being able to sort of render pages based upon the URL and stuff like that, and you know, mind blown. You know, suddenly, oh my god, you know, I can cut all this down so much. Um, so you know, I I got into it sort of the same way he did. You know, just uh, you know, through the through the top layer rather than the bottom up. Yeah. So um, sorry, I you touched on a few things there, but uh, so what languages prior to PHP uh, had you played with then? I guess. Um. Well, I mean, basic. I so I came from procedural. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't really anything serious. I never built any programs or anything. I was just, you know, playing around with it. Yeah. Um, and that was mostly, you know, out of my own initiative. So I didn't have, you know, teachers or anyone showing me or anything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the thing about PHP is it has, it has such a low barrier to entry. Yeah. yeah. So easy to pick up as a language. Yeah. So I guess you get into it, you know, coming from, you know, markup and JavaScript. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really easy language to get into. Yes. Back yeah. then, also, you didn't have the the heavy, you know, object oriented, you know, patterns that are in the language now. Um, so working with it, you know, you were working with it more as, you know, like a um, a templating language, uh, you know, which yeah. is, you know, its origins. Yeah. Um, then you know, I, I I suppose like most people, I grew up, you know, with the the ob- object oriented nature of the language with PHP five. Yeah. Um, I never really got into the objects in PHP four. It was really when PHP five came out that you know I kind of started picking up on you know. Okay, you know, there's a different way of thinking about this. Um, and I, I was lucky to be, you know, surrounded by people who, who rubbed off on me, really strong object oriented background. So I picked it up really quickly early on. I think that's a really interesting point though, because like you say, like, uh, I, PHP is quite famous for the, um, low barrier for entry, but I guess it's not as low as it used to be. I guess if you want to do it the right way, um, right. it'd be interesting because obviously it's hard to say now with hindsight, but, how easy it would be to learn PHP from scratch now compared to what it was when we, when we were first starting out, I guess, in the kind of procedural sense. Right. But that's um, for the best, but, uh, you know, it's interesting. Right. Um, so after that, um, the next years were constant refactoring cycles. So, you know, you realize every month that your code sucks yep. uh, because you, as you, as you grow and evolve as a programmer, uh, you know, you learn new stuff, you learn different ways of doing the same thing, but better. Um, so you, you end up sort of going over your code and, you know, rewriting it, you know, every, you know, two weeks or whatever, uh, until you get to a point where you, you start thinking the right way, you know, when you actually come to the code. And I think that's where you, you sort of start thinking about what you're going to do before you do it. Cause I think one of the things that, that distinguishes a junior program to a senior programmer is that a junior will just jump into the code. They say, oh, okay, I'm going to write away. this. Yep. Yeah. Right. I'm going to make something do something. I'm going to make it work instead of thinking, okay, how should this thing work? Yeah. You know, the big difference between, you know, just hacking it and, and getting something together, you know, to making a, a really well designed application or program or something extensible, or if you're working in a team, you know, really important other people understand, you know, where you're coming from, what you're doing. Completely agree with you there. Yeah. It's that kind of, I think juniors, they like the quick fix or they like the quick hit and then they're not real. And I think that's, so with like a senior or something, like, you know, you get the experience well, and. I think- They've not been burnt, have they? You know, that, they, that's they don't it. Know. Yeah, because I suppose we all, I mean, that's the thing. Like when you start off, you do just start hacking away and it's that whole cool like REPL loop of being able to see, oh, wow, look what happened on the screen when I did that and CMS yeah. pages and all that. So, yeah, it, and as you say, then you start kind of looking away from it and then that's when obviously like kind of the design of it, architecture really comes into play. That it's okay, you can obviously implement something, but it's how you implement it with a team, as you were saying, like, you know, making it modular and stuff like that because we've already dealt with like years of headaches because we've hacked together the system and there's a better way of doing it with all the team and stuff. And um, I mean, I read a really great tweet. I, I can't remember who it was by, um, but it, he, uh, he said, uh, junior programmers think they know more than they do. Uh, <laughs> senior programmers uh, think they know less than they actually do. And experienced programmers hate computers. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good tweet. That is a very nice summary. 
So I mean, that's I, and and unfortunately, I'm moving into the experience program uh, because right now I hate uh, writing code. Yeah, because when, when I write code, I I feel like I'm doing something wrong because I'm a programmer. So I I have that kind of idea that you know if I'm skilled at what I do, it should really feel like the least effort possible. Um, that you know, pessimistic and we're, 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 kind of look at your code. Yeah, just, I yeah. mean, you, you you grow that kind of cynical kind of you know way to see you know your your profession. But if I feel that I'm writing a ton of code, I just immediately get this feeling that I'm doing something wrong. You know, if I'm having to write so much code, all of that code, you know, imagine all the possible edge cases that I'm introducing, all the possible bugs, yeah, all the unit tests it's going to require. Uh, all of the time it's going to take another developer to come along and understand what I've done. You know, assuming you know I've, I've tried to keep as much as possible to design patterns so they can understand you know, where you know I've taken certain decisions. Um, but when you when you build code, what you're building is is debt. You're building legacy. So the least code you write, the better. That's it. It, it kind of and as you say, the barrier to entry then for your code base is reduced because you haven't got that much code to deal with in the first place. Right, totally. And I mean, frameworks really, you know, fit well into this kind of, you know, uh, paradigm, you know, because they take away a lot of the work. Um, and not only the work of having to actually build whatever you're building, but the maintenance of it, because yep. you see shifting that all off to somebody else or, or a group of people. So did you go to a uh, university to study software, computer science, software design no. and stuff like that? No, I've got nothing. No, no titles to my name whatsoever. That's the way we like it. That is we the way we like it. This show, you know, we just find the the best programmers, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, I t- and I we've got a, we've got a we've got a process that we follow at KDC for hiring. Yeah, um, literally, we're not interested in your CV. That's we cool. want to see your code. Your code is your CV. That's it. You know what, James? Me and Ed had that exact same conversation this morning, didn't we? Just privately on Skype, like that. We were just talking about that. We just don't care about what's on someone's CV. It's all about passion and what they've learned in their spare time. It's like you can pick and you can pick out the BS in five minutes of talking yeah. to someone. You can pick out, okay, this guy or girl really cares about programming and understands it. Then, yeah. you know, oh, great. You've got a couple of titles to your name, et cetera. You obviously are able just to kind of fly through that. And right. Unless you're like me and you walk into an interview and you say, I hate writing code. <laughs> <laughs> like, I hate code. Why do we bother doing this? Let's all just quit and go on holiday. <laughs> the thing that would set off alarm bells for me if I was interviewing a, a developer would be if someone came in and said, yeah, I, I know so much. I know it all. Because then for me, that's a sure giveaway that they don't. like. And also it's like the saying, like, I know it's hard to kind of in that kind of process, pick out someone who knows that you've got to keep learning, having yeah. that addiction to learning and to always self-improve. Um, I think probably that's when you were talking about James, like, when you do write code, you always think to yourself, actually, I'm a bit pessimistic. It's like, oh, I'm going to refactor this in two weeks because I'm going to make it, you know, the wrong move now or something. Um, but you kind of just have to think sometimes it's just shipping out code for that problem at that time. Um, and with, with your hindsight, you know, obviously hindsight's 2020, so you can go, re- go back, but you are going to make some mistakes, but you're going to look at previous experience, but also obviously what other people are doing in the profession. Right. I mean, I, I personally only trust people who at some point in their life had, have hated themselves for what they've done. Yeah. Yep. So if you meet someone, they say, "Yeah, I hated myself for writing this huge class, which I spent like a weekend trying to refactor." Okay, I, you know, I believe stuff you're going to tell me is true, because you've been, yeah. you know, you've been, you know, debugging that you, painful. You've code had that pain. Weekend. Yeah. You had that yeah. pain in the early hours of the morning, just tearing your hair out, thinking, "Why? Yeah. Why?" I, I mean, I'm seeing it like through my wife now. Uh, when she walks down the street and other, you know, uh, women who have had children kind of look at her and they give you that kind of, well, I, they don't give me, but they give her the kind of look she's been talking about it. They kind of look at her like, mm-hmm, I know what's going yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know what's going to happen. I know yeah. what you're going to go through. <laughs> yeah. Just I don't, high five. I don't see a day where I'd ever consider myself anything more than a junior developer. I don't know whether that's, I don't know why, but I would, I just never feel like I'm anything I've progressed past that. I'm, I'm definitely trying all the time, but I just never feel like I'm, I'm past that. Like you say, I always look at my code and think that could be a lot better. But I guess it's also that, that thing that you, you can get to a point where you overthink your code and then nothing would ever get shipped, I guess. I mean, right. That, yeah. Well, I mean, you get developers who try to prove a point, right? When you talk yeah. to them and they're, they're trying to get their argument across. For me, you know, you're, you're in a more of a senior role if the confidence of your code is proven you know, technically, yeah. you know, I don't have to, I don't have to, you know, eat away at you to get you to agree that what I've done is good. I can yeah. technically prove that what I've done is good or good enough. Absolutely. Yeah. And the point, you know, you were talking about with design and, and that kind of stuff, which is just as important as your, your knowledge of the language 
like I, it's really hard, but like obviously I, I followed that, that same pattern that you're talking about really with like the procedural and the OO and all that kind of stuff. And, but until I played with like MVC, it, I couldn't have imagined it. I couldn't conceptualize that in my mind. It was only when I started playing with it that I started realizing how much better it was and how much more organized my code was and more manageable. But I'm not the kind of guy that, that can kind of create or, be the guy who came up with the idea of MVC. I wish I was, but it's just for me, I'm always kind of following design patterns and learning from other people, I guess. Right. Well, I mean, MVC kind of came around, I mean, not by mistake, but you know, it was like the really early days, like the seventies when you know, small talk came out. Yeah. And I, it's, it's kind of like they introduced it by mistake. It was kind of like one of these, you know, features of, of small talk. This is how you work with views and stuff. Yeah. I don't think they, they knew back then, you know, how important of an architectural design it was going to become. Yeah. Because I mean, they, you know, the amount of languages and frameworks and everything which kind of, you know, adapts the, to the idea of MVC, you know, however that is, because, you know, everyone has their own interpretation and you have the, the, the fanatics and you have the purists and, you know, oh, that's not MVC because you're not kind of communicating to the model through this that's channel it. or whatever. <laughs> so they, they're just about to say. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, most of the people I just say, okay, go use, you know, the Django for a bit. And then you come back to me and you tell me if you know, you know, a pure idea of MVC. Every single framework has its way of doing it and you either like it or you don't. But I try to avoid getting into the, the criticism of yeah. you're doing yeah. it right, you're doing it wrong. Okay. Yes. Well, does your implementation have any benefits? And most of the people who are using, you know, something like the Django or, you know, on Python, they'll say, yeah, you know, they have a different way of doing it, but it really works because look at this great application of it. So, I mean, uh, I know obviously we, we talked about, uh, a little bit about your involvement with Cake, but it's, uh, it's okay to ask you a few more questions about uh, uh, how you're involved with that project and um, sure. and how much you contribute to that. So I guess, how did you start with, how did you first get involved with, with Cake, I guess? So I discovered Cake PHP around uh, 2009-ish. Um, yeah. Just before that, uh, in I think it's about 2007, I started on a project. Um, and eventually in, in 2008, so the next year, uh, we landed some funding, uh, and we created a startup. Um, but, uh, this was like a few months before the huge market crash. You know, I don't know if people saw that coming. We didn't. So we had this, you know, big chunk of money and we had this project, uh, and we, you know, we're going to build something. We, uh, there were three of us. We had money and fame in our eyes, you know, as you do at that age. I mean, we're so yeah. much mature now, right? <laughs> you can interpret that as cynical again. Uh, <laughs> So we, we, we had to change our direction with the project, um, cause our dream kind of got crushed, you know, as, as soon as every, I think it was sort of like the January or February when, you know, everything kind of came yeah. you know, plummeting down. Yeah. So we decided to change strategy and, you know, we built out some of the tech and we s- sold it off. Uh, and that worked pretty well because we managed to sort of, you know, get ourselves out of a tight situation, you know, owing people money because that's uh, not nice ever. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I, I, you know, I had to go in a different direction because, you know, my whole plan of becoming, you know, next Steve Jobs with my startup failed. So, uh, I discovered KPHP and I was, you know, doing some stuff with it, uh, nothing major. Uh, but as time went by, you kind of give up your, you know, I can do it all myself attitude and you settle down with reality. Yeah. And reality was that when I used KPHP, I could knock stuff out in like a week or two weeks. So mm-hmm. it was just like a no brainer, you know, okay, well, this thing works. And you, you kind of, once you get uh, more into a framework and you sort of open up into that, that area of development, because I mean, I, I know people who know nothing about frameworks. They write PHP and, you know, they've been picked up by a company or something and that company has some, you know, propriety, something locally, you know, and they're using that. They never, they never open to that kind of arena. So when you do become open it, you realize, you know, okay, well, there are more frameworks. Yeah, there are even frameworks on other languages, yeah. you know, and mm. you can start, you know, choosing, you know, go with your shopping list and say, you know, why well, I want to do all of this. So I'll see what frameworks out there. And I played around with other stuff. Um, I did, I did a lot of stuff with, uh, Symphony uh, back in the day, Symphony one, the, the original Symphony. The lovely Symphony. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Zen framework. I did some stuff as well. And, uh, well, back then it was, uh, Kahana, I think was more or less on the way out. Uh, coding Nider was kicking around. Um, but I kind of played around with stuff, but because I'd become, accustomed or, or familiar or, or comfortable with KPHP, I kind of, you know, stuck with it. You know, it worked for me. I, you know, I, I did see shortcomings and you see, you know, better things done in other frameworks or, you know, the vice versa, I see things better done in KPHP. But it, for me, it came to a point you know, where you have to make a trade-off. You know, does this work for me 
or am I going to be jumping from one thing to another? I, I understand the idea of, you know, the right tool for the job, but there is a point when you specialize. So if I become really fluent with a framework, even though that framework may not be good as another framework doing something, I can do it really quick because I know how that framework does. It. Uh, so I stuck with uh, KPHP. Um, I did a bunch of stuff in my own time. Uh, then I got picked up by KDC around two and a half years ago, uh, where I'm now the company director. Um, and since then, I do this day in, day out as a living. So I kind of fell into it. I, it wasn't like that was my goal or target. You know, I'm going to become a, a solid KPHP developer and a core member. That's what I'm going to do. It, it kind of just went in that direction. And I mean, I come from the enterprise anyway, and the enterprise kind of thinks of frameworks as toys. You know, enterprise is all about, you know, big, you know, corporate solutions and, you know, somebody's going to sell you a license and that license is going to cover you. and system for that one person. And... Oh, God, I've seen some crap. Yep. Like really, really <laughs> bad stuff. <Yep. laughs> And you think about it, and I remember getting really angry once because I was working at this company and they hired this consultant to give training and they literally paid that consultant for four hours of time my monthly salary. Wow. wow. And it just, <laughs> it, it sickens you because yeah. you see that, you know, okay, business is getting in the way of, you know, what's really important, you know, which is using the right tech and, you know, getting something really great done. I completely agree. I mean, actually, with PHP, one thing I do like about it is the documentation is great mm-hmm. on it i think that's one of its strong points um so what what stuff do you uh, do you uh, do commits to the actual master then and stuff like that put in merge requests or does someone else deal with that side of it no well i mean kphp is it, i mean it's it's like other frameworks but it is kind of different so uh, let me put it into perspective laravel right yep. uh, taylor owns and runs laravel uh symphony is I think mostly organized and driven by Fabian. Yeah. Uh, Zend is, I, you know, I, I don't feel there's a real corporate hand over Zend, but it is kind of, you know, their, uh, I don't know whether you call it like a, you know, open source project or whatever, it's, but it's the open source side of Zend. Um, you know, the company Zend. Um, and then, then, you know, there's a bunch of others like Code Igniter. Code Igniter is run by Ellis Labs. And, and, and they've had all that fun stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember Phil Sturgeon. I, and I'm mentioning this guy a lot. He's going to think I'm stalking him. But, uh, <laughs> uh, he, you know, he mentioned about three and that really great pull request, which was made against the docs, you know, to improve it. And they kind of turned it down because said, no, no, this isn't the way we would do it. And then they kind of don't do anything. That's it. And they just don't. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing was the legal thing of something, you know, that the image or something rubbish, they have to own the right. right. No to... idea. And they, they kind of crushed the image on their own. So it's they didn't really so need any help. Stupid. Um, but anyway, uh, KPHP is kind of different because even though Larry Masters is, is the founder or the, 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 the remaining founder of the, the framework, um, the framework is uh, the only entity really behind it is the Cake Software Foundation. So that's the, the not-for-profit found organization behind the framework, but it doesn't dictate anything. It doesn't mandate anything over the, over the actual project or how things are done, uh, or anything like that on, on a technical level. It's entirely 100% community driven. So the people who are there are the people who are making it happen. That's the people who cool. get involved are the people who are making certain features appear or certain features improve, uh, or changing certain things in the framework. There's a core team. Um, but that core team are basically, you know, people like me, you know, I, I, I did stuff with the framework. I did more stuff with the framework and then I get involved with the framework. Um, I, I, I was doing stuff with the, um, with the community and stuff like that. And even though I do do, you know, I asked about commits and stuff like that. I do do pull requests. I, you know, I've done some stuff, you know, on the, on the framework level or the, on a, on a code level. Um, but I get involved a lot in the community because, you know, I, I, try and move with you know connections and get things happening to you know help that's the, the hard bit project. i think i think the bit yeah. you're doing is the hard bit and especially for developers developers don't deal well with that type of thing no and i mean the thing is is we got a huge community like really really huge uh we got uh, just like some stats we got like you know fourteen thousand likes on facebook and we got 11 11 000 followers on twitter uh there's uh a google group uh, something crazy. We have like 18,000 members and there's something around 32,000 topics in there. Uh, it's just like that a huge insane. thing. And the thing is, is keep in mind that, you know, KPHP was open sourced in 2005. So it's been around for almost 10 years now. Yeah, so I mean, it is one of the original. That's crazy because you know, that's been around. I mean, 2006 was Code Igniter. So you've literally right. had the whole life of Code Igniter. You've uh, been around KCAS. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, to be honest with you, the, the one which came after everyone was Zend. Zend was the one which kind of popped in like a year or two later. But Codeigniter, Symphony, and Cake were kind of the ones which kind of all landed in that year. Um, and, and I say landed, it's when they were really open source yeah. and you know, something started happening. Obviously, people were coding a lot before then, but you know, people will say, well, you know, when was it open source? So that's the date. Um, so yeah, t- uh, 10 years is a long time for any open source framework. Um, so, you know, other frameworks which have been around a long time as well, you know, like Symphony Code 9, it's respectable. But yeah, I mean, we, it was open sourced under MIT, so, you know, really flexible license. That's it was very cool. for commercial projects. Um, but the, the community drive behind the framework, obviously there's, it does ferment a kind of chaos, and, and it's a good chaos, so, you know, there's, it's, it's kind of led by opinion. So, you know, if you get enough people on your side and enough people who like a feature or want to implement something, it gets done. But that's, you know, how you drive it, you know, community wise. I'm, I'm not well versed with how, you know, Taylor or, or Fabian, you know, run their, their projects. They probably, you know, have a, a decision taking process or, or, you know, like a community kind of referendum. Um, but in KPHP is very much driven by, you know, okay, well, how much do people want this? And people who are contributing the code, how good is the code? You know, we do have sort of controls there to make sure, you know, code that's being delivered has unit tests, uh, make sure, you know, the, the coverage on that's quite good. Uh, if documentation needs to be added, someone then usually gets onto the documentation. Uh, the, the, you mentioned the docs. The docs themselves are also open sourced. So almost all of the stuff that you read on the docs has been contributed by the community. That is great. Yeah, so we got, I think we got something like 320 something contributors to the documentation. Uh, and we got over 270 to the project itself. So there's a lot of people involved with it. And obviously that's good. That's the idea of open source, right? A lot of eyes. Absolutely. You know, didn't, didn't work for Heartbleed, but. Yeah, that was a, that was a stressful couple of days. Um, can I just ask a quick question then? Obviously you talked about the, the original startup that you had and everything. Did that lead, leave a bad taste in your mouth? Did you, was there a point where you'd, you'd had, to, I mean, you joked about it a little bit before about being fed up with programming, but. Mm. What was the feeling after that? Were you, did you still have the fire in your belly after that or did it make yeah, you stronger? I think what it, well, what it left me with more than anything was a desire to still do it. Yeah. So it, I felt like it was unfulfilled. You know, that we, we could have done something. We had the money and there, there were three of us and I, I think we were pretty good at what we were doing. Yeah. Um, and we, I th- really think, you know, if, if we'd given the chance, we would have pulled it off. The, the fact that it got cut short so soon and that we spent sort of like a year building stuff constantly thinking, you know, that this isn't going to be what it was going to be. We're just going to, you know, build it and ship it. Uh, One thing that did do is it installed the idea of building product. So one of of the bad things that I find about people who are, you know, early entrepreneurs and they're getting involved with with, uh, projects, I see a lot of them come through KDC. You know, we work on some pretty large scale projects. A lot of people have funding, you know, like in the millions. So I see these people with stars in their eyes. And, you know, I feel like, you know what, we didn't have millions, but, you know, I've been there. I know Mm. what that's like. Yeah. And I do see how they get blinded. They get blinded by the idea of, you know, doing something great, but never really focusing on the product. And they're really thinking, okay, what exactly are we building and how are we building it? Yeah. And I think that the fact that we took the, we had to change our strategy and we had to go in that different direction did install that idea in me, you know, that everything you build is product. Whether you're building a little note taking application or you're building, you know, huge, you know, e-commerce platform, everything is product. And if you think about it as a product and you think about the end user as your client, it changes your perspective on what you're building. It's no longer, you know, incredible that you can write everything on one line. It, yeah. it doesn't matter anymore. That is what matters, very true. What, yeah. yeah. What you're building is maintainable. And it is going to have longevity. If if that's what you're doing, then you're, you're being successful even before you have that success. I guess, like in some ways, business gets in the way of good programming. I think, I'm certainly in my experience working in a, like an agency type environment where perhaps our and our, our clients aren't programmers themselves, and really to them, the code isn't really. They don't really mind what it looks like as long as the actual end product. As long as it does, it's the product, isn't it? Again, it's that in out, you know, does it do yeah. what I want it to do? But no, I completely agree on that. And kind of a sidetrack, it's like with Cake, so where, what do you feel that stands out in your mind in Cake, like the features or something in it that, you know, really kind of sets it apart from other like frameworks in, that, in the space? Um, well, the first thing that appealed to me was the out of the box solution. The fact that you can, you know, literally just unpack it and run it with very little setup so you know right from the beginning i didn't feel like you know there was this big impact on me as a developer you know it was just you know here's something that works you know put it where you need to put it and then do stuff and it happens 
Um, and I mean, th that's probably where a lot of the tight coupling came from in the framework because the framework was built sort of as a, a, a single product. So there was never this sort of concern for, okay, do we need low cohesion so, you know, people can start, you know, injecting stuff? Uh, do we need to, you know, uh, oh, I mean, there's extensibility, you know, there's plugins and there's, you can use vendor libraries. But it, internally, KPHP works really well because it's built to work really well. You know, I use the, the anagram of, you know, Apple versus PC. You know, Apple build their hardware, they build their tech, they build their software. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always work really well. But, you know, <laughs> but when it does, you know, they're, they're giving you this kind of experience. whole experience. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. They control the whole experience. Yeah, they know all the endpoints. They, they, they know the workflow from beginning to end. And I think that's what most attracted me to KPHP. You know, that I felt like, okay, when I'm using this, I'm not, it's, it's, you know, like with the PC, it was just always a problem with the driver or you just spend, you know, 400 bucks on a, on a, on a new video game card or whatever. And you put it in and, oh, it's not working. I'm not getting the framework I need, you know, because it's not really built to work together. So you're kind of working around stuff all the time. And, you know, I know that the direction everything's heading in now is really good, you know, with, you know, composers kind of, you know, pushing a lot the idea of breaking everything out, you know, giving more modularity to the, to the framework space. Um, you know, the figure doing, you know, good stuff about, you know, uh, defining how those things should, you know, interact with each other. So everything's going really in the right direction. But, you know, this is stuff that's come before. This is nothing new, you know, it's, and it's happened in different spaces, like, you know, with, with the PC. It's, it's a, a problem that does have a solution. But it's a lot of effort to get to that. That's it, solution. isn't it? That yeah. is it. It's the hard work to get to it. It's easy to say right. it, but it's like the whole, you know, like a high cohesion, low coupling. It's fine to say those those four words, but actually doing it is a whole other ball game. Right, and I think things like GitHub, for example, have introduced a lot of uh, have introduced a stronger social layer into you know programming and you know working together, especially in the open source world. So there's now a lot of opinion. It's a very, it's very opinionated in, yeah. in the framework world. It always has been, but right now it's kind of reinforced by this kind of platform, you know, where you can be opinionated. Oh, write a comment on this PR. And That's just, exactly uh, it. You can flame and troll and do whatever you want. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's good because most of the time it works really well because it's constructive conversation. Um, but it does get to a point where you say, okay, well, how, you know, how much are we building a solution versus, uh, socially acceptable code? I think Jose Lorenzo was, was talking to me the other day about somebody who had been talking about dependency injection in KPHP. And he said, you know, well, KPHP works for what you want it to do. You know, we can introduce all the dependency injections. You can literally switch everything out everywhere. But to what extent really does it start interfering with that out of the box solution idea? And I'm, I'm really strong for, you know, design patterns and, you know, building stuff with a, a, a common purpose so that when you move from one thing to another, you know what you're dealing with. But, you know, there is a point where you need to start saying, okay, you know, well, this, this thing that I'm using, does it actually fulfill my needs? That's it, isn't it? Exactly. The because at the end of the day, most, most of, yeah, most of the people who chant, you know, you know, dependency injection and, and IOC, you know, it's, it comes to a point where you say, well, you know, how much do you actually use that? You know, do you actually do a lot of that in your code? Are you actually building your code so it's extensible to the point that you can literally just switch out, you know, dependencies? Because most people don't. You know, because it's not necessary. Yeah. You know, if you have a client who comes to you and say, I want to build a note taking app, what dependencies are you going to switch out? Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not going yeah. to happen. You know, definitely in the enterprise space, a lot of that happens and it's, you know, serious. You know, I, I follow, you know, Martin Fowler, you know, all the stuff that he talks about, you know, the, the whole idea of, you know, um, micro, uh, microservices and, uh, the, the idea that everything is sort of moving more to a service oriented architecture now, uh, where you have very highly decoupled uh, services which literally just have an IO, uh, you know, kind of like yep. the the extreme route that uh, Amazon took. Yes. <laughs> um, and I like that. I like that personally. But you know, when you're building your note taking app, uh, I'm not going to build a software oriented architecture. That's it. And I suppose it's also with agency work. You know, shipping stuff out again. It's like, do you need do you need this kind of you know this massive hammer? You know, to you know for a sledgehammer when all you just really need is a small hammer that can do the job at that time. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you have to be realistic as well, you know, because maybe your note taking app is going to turn into you know something really huge, and you know that's foreseen. So then you would take maybe a different approach to your design. But you know, usually a note taking app doesn't go beyond the note taking app. That's it. That is it. So. Because currently the stable release is 2.5. Correct. And there's, uh, I've been looking into three and stuff like that and mm -hmm. looking at the like the actual GitHub, you know, and everything and the docs for it and everything. Um, there seems to be a lot of work done, specifically like in the RM using PSR standards and then the whole idea mm -hmm. we're talking about with decoupling and modularizing the components. 
Right. Um, it, can you can you just uh, briefly like say what is the aim of three? Um, kind of for yeah. So so really for the user, what can they see when they get three? What will be different to them? Okay. So KPHP has been really strong about backwards compatibility. Uh, it's been really important that for us there's been a migration path. So going from KPHP 1.2 to 1.3 to 2.0 and 2.0 up to 2.5, it was relatively easy to to take that path. So if you were going to move from one version to another, it was, you know, pay, not, not painless, but there wasn't a lot of pain in it. Um, you know, like a lot of people with Laravel, you know, the big hype around Laravel right now, maybe some of them don't know, you know, Laravel has been written, rewritten like three times. So it's really like three frameworks. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, putting Taylor down. He's, he's going, you know, with evolution. He wants to push things forward and he wants to evolve the framework. I think that's really good. But, you know, we've taken a different approach in that we've wanted to, uh, support our community in moving from one version to another. However, we've been around for almost 10 years. So we were around in, in the PHP 4 days. Um, we had actually implemented a lot of stuff in the PHP 4 days, which was then natively available in PHP 5. Uh, so we dragged a lot of legacy along, uh, especially to 1.3 and then to 2.0. Since 2.0, we've been trying to, you know, get rid of that legacy as much as possible without giving people too much pain, you know, with the applications they have built on Cake. But it has gotten to the point that the uh, PHP as a language has grown up really fast in yeah. the last year. Yeah, with absolutely. Five four and five five, and the features that have been introduced really do add uh, a lot of versatility to the language itself. And the problem we have, for example, is you know we we have a, a um, an autoloader, but it doesn't work on on namespaces per se. It sort of works on what we call dot notation internally. Um, but we want to move obviously to the native support, you know, for using names namespaces in, in PHP itself. Uh, PHP three is now moving to use traits. Uh, we're using a lot of anonymous functions. Uh, a lot of the features which are available now in the language, and we don't have to act, have to actually implement. But the problem is, is in the language maturing really quickly, uh, KPHP is sort of lagged behind. And it's lagged behind to a point that it's very difficult for us to sort of start introducing these features without breaking backwards compatibility. Like, for example, with the namespaces. As soon yeah, as you introduce that's namespaces, it, isn't it? You if you're not supporting it, it, it changes everything. You know, you can't, you can't easily introduce that. It's, it's, it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not like, okay, well, if you upgrade now, you, you now just start using namespaces. It's not that easy. So we did have to make some tough decisions around the backwards compatibility. Uh, so in, in being a major version step, uh, we've taken the decision to out a lot of the old and bring a lot of the new in. Uh, and the ORM is one of the things which has probably dragged the most legacy. Um, I, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, KPHP, but, you know, KPHP's biggest trait is probably the fact that it uses arrays. People have this uh, inhuman hate for arrays. <laughs> <laughs> it's... It's just ridiculous. And, and the problem is, is, if you look at PHP, the language itself, you know, underneath, it's all hash tables. This is it. So yeah. even if you're using an object, it, it doesn't really make much difference, except the fact that you can start using methods on your objects and stuff like that. So you can do a lot more cool stuff with objects. But it wasn't really a major limiting factor uh, to how you use KPHP. KPHP just had a way of doing stuff. It will give you back an array result, and then you, you know, plug in the array result again if you're going to change something, and you can run with it. But it's true that, you know, that's kind of a legacy that's been dragged out and it's not something we were really looking at maintaining down the line. So we took the decision to say, okay, well, we're going to, you know, up the ORM to now start using objects. It actually uses a table registry, uh, which returns you entities. Um, so it's a lot more powerful as to how you can interact with the data. Um, a lot of people were calling for us to uh, start including Doctrine and stuff like that. Um, but we, we did make the decision that, you know, there's really great stuff out there. And Doctrine is amazing. But there's, you know, the out of the box solution idea. You know, if we start making KPHP just a collection of stuff, for us it kind of ceases to be KPHP. It's just a collection it's, of stuff. It's lost its goal. The, the goal that you want to be, as you say, yeah, that product. Right. And the problem right now is you can literally build your own framework. Yeah. You from just, just like all these components. A yeah, you just create a composer file and you can put everything together and yep. it works. It's Some people are really happy with that. They like working like that. But KPHP does have this kind of niche in the market for people who like to just, you know, unpack it, and put it there, start working with it and ship. Because uh, I, I noticed actually the cake, the current version, it, it's, it support is compatible from down to 5.2, which is quite amazing yes. still. That, that is amazing because obviously it's it, like keeping that, that, uh, that like state of backwards compatibility must be, as you say, the blow through the years and stuff. And yeah, it's the, difficult because it, it, it is kind of like it's marking your own tomb. That's it. Because Absolutely. you're saying, well, you know, well, 
we're we're kind of limiting the kind of stuff we can do. And and the, and the thing is, a lot of plugins have arisen for for KPHP, which immediately state you need KPHP 5.3 for this. You know, because I'm using anonymous functions or you know whatever. So the community is already kind of kind yeah, of moved the, forward as well. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said, the community is pushing it, and the community is you know the one who who builds you know the end result of the project. So if the community is pushing for this to happen, then it has to happen. Yeah. It's true that there are a lot of people out there who just don't care. You know, they'll use cake whether it uses arrays on or objects. They'll use it whether it has namespaces or it doesn't have namespaces. Uh, one of the cool things actually with uh, 3.0 is you decide to actually upgrade to 5 uh, 5.4. Um, mm-hmm. I was wondering, was that that must have been quite a hard decision to make? Which version to go with? And like, yeah. So, um, I mean, it's not still on the table, but there are people kind of saying, you know, well, you know, five five, five this six. Is it. Yeah, you, know, you had this. You have this one chance to kind of make the set the base, and it's like, where do right. you put it? Why? Why don't we make the leap? And you know, where the, the way we see it is okay. Five four is really stable now. Um, it's got a lot of support, you know, in the community and, and by hosting environments and, you know, what have you. So, you know, for us, it's a solid version of the language to go with. It is true that, you know, the PHP language core are really pushing for people to always stay up to date with the latest version, which I think is really good. It's a very difficult task to take on That's, as well. That is it. Yeah. But, um, you know, way we see it is, okay, we're going to aim for 5.4. And hopefully, if the uh, new version of the framework is, you know, mature, the language is obviously moving in a very mature and very quick direction as well. It's possible we'll be able to keep up with it. So it's not going to be like, you know, with uh, with KPHP two, which we kind of locked into five point two, but we could possibly, you know, evolve with the language as we go. That is very cool. And I know, as I look at it in your composer JSON file, like you've uh, you've got a couple of dependencies, like a carbon, and then obviously RC Maxwell's the password compat. What made you choose Carbon mm-hmm. then? Was it just because it's pretty much the de facto date time kind of? Yeah, yeah, mostly because of the support. So obviously when you're taking on a dependency, a really important thing is, is you know, if I'm going to introduce this into my product, you know, how well is it going to fit in with, you know, everything we've got? Is is the support going to be, you know, is there going to be good longevity on the support? Uh, you know, is there a good community kind of, you know, gathered around it? You know, is, is it well maintained? Uh, so yeah, I mean, mostly the fact that it was de facto uh, was, was the decision that was made. Um, but we, we needed, there's certain things that you need to kind of go with to make sure that, you know, you are keeping up with the community, but you're also introducing features that people are very, very used to. So, you know, for us, you know, rather than, you know, re, you know, reinventing the will or having to, you know, rewrite all of our, you know, time, date and everything in the framework, we can just take something on that's, you know, really well supported. I think that's right. Have there been any other decisions for other kind of components to bring that in or is that really? Um, there's well, there's an optional component for the uh, for the sniffer. Um, uh, that, that's optional though. For and there are there's discussion around stuff. You know what could be included in the framework and what couldn't be included in the framework. Right now, uh, there's not much on the table, but there is something which is going on around migrations. Um, uh, right. Yeah. Right with uh, Finks. Uh, but you know most of it is most of it is orientated towards you know if we're going to sort of offload onto something else. Making sure that whatever that something else is, you know, is going to be really well supported and stays up until around. Now, <laughs> right, and up until now, the only real dependency that we've had, and it's not really a hard dependency, um, but it's a dependency which is PHP unit. Um, we had simple tests with uh, PHP KPHP 1.3, and when we changed to two, we we basically ripped out simple tests and we started using PHP unit. Um, and obviously that was a good decision because it has become kind of the, the de facto. facto. That's it. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, pretty much all these projects rely on that. I think that's another thing. So. If, you know, for some reason something does happen to Sebastian, you know, that project will stay alive because of how many people need it, really. Right, definitely. Um, also, so what was the hardest piece, do you think, for, for moving from 2.5 to 3? Uh, the ORM. The ORM. Without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. I mean, that is, it's the closest thing to a rewrite. Uh, oh, well, wow. I mean, it is a rewrite basically. Uh, but I do know that, uh, the, the main developer who's been working on it is Jose Lorenzo. Uh, there are other people who have been very involved with it, like, uh, Andy, Tuz- Andy Dawson. Um, I think, uh, Mark Story's been very involved in it as well. But it, it has been mostly Jose Lorenzo's drive behind it. Uh, you know, based upon, you know, his ideas for what he's wanted to do for some time. Um, the, the it's very similar to the, the KPH2 model layer. But it does, it breaks it out into a different path. So you still interact with your data, you know, through the, you know, you can do your finds on, on your entity, on your uh, tables and things like that. Uh, the conventions are very similar. There's only, you know, slight changes here and there, you know, with regard to, I think it's singular and plural, uh, around naming of things. 
but mainly you can move from one to the other. We've, we're working on a, a side, it's not a side project, it's kind of an extra repo called the upgrade. Uh, and that is a bunch of tools which is used to move an app from two to three. Oh, that is So cool. hopefully we can take a lot of the pain away from That would be really nice. I think the community would definitely like that, the idea to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, we've always, we've always shipped a migration shell with, with the framework. Um, so you, there's a shell which you've been able to run. The problem is, is people get into the kind of, you know, I am going to reinvent the wheel. And they don't follow conventions or they do things, <laughs> yep. they work around the framework. And the problem is when you run a migration shell, the migration says, I don't know what this is. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this, isn't, this, isn't code, this isn't Kate PP, you know, <laughs> this is some crazy thing. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's, we're still strong about, you know, maintaining the community, allowing people to move from one version to the other. So this definitely isn't kind of a make and break. Uh, so it, it, nobody's going to be left behind. You know, we, we're really strong about that, making sure that, you know, the community feels like, you know, the framework you know the, the the people who are behind the project, the, the main people driving the, uh, the development. Uh, th- there is a real sense of caring about you know people being able to continue with the project without a you know huge that and painful cool. job. Because how how long are you going to support two point five when three is released? Uh, well, the, the talk recently is somewhere around three years, uh, maybe three or four years. I mean, we don't know. I mean, look at look at the, uh, the time one point three has been supported. We're still yeah, supporting it now. True. That's very yeah. true. Um, and you know we're 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 getting to the point now where we're kind of tired people who are working on older versions of the framework 1.3 1.2 and it's not always their fault you know you come to a project that's written in cake 1.2 and there's been no money there's been no money quite you know to be able to put put it over and you're stuck you're technically stuck with it Um, so you know just to know people have that a feeling that okay i can migrate this up Uh, you know maybe there's going to be some work on you know my end because it was you know outsourced to some company which didn't care at all what they were doing Um, but you know there is a path and you know you can take it there may be some pain along the way, but you can get that. Actually, looking at the docs and stuff, like I had a little play around with, because Cake Pitch, I, I played around with it a bit a couple of years ago, but then kind of haven't had the chance to do any stuff with it recently. And so I, w- mm-hmm. I went back to had a little play around it this weekend. And some of the stuff that I really like, the behaviors, I really like behaviors. I think they're such a clever, and it's great that the idea really was that you kind of invented traits before traits even came into the language. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> Um, when you edit this, you can actually repeat that like over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, w- one of the, one of the things about behaviors is it, it allowed us to do stuff with the, with the models, which, you know, the language itself didn't allow us to do. We had to be able to, you know, build some kind of proxy so we could, you know, get to things. Um, and the, uh, behaviors, the, the pattern of the behaviors isn't the same as comp- components for the controller, but it is a way that you can extend. And that's a big thing about KPHP. And it's one of the things which I feel doesn't get promoted enough. KPHP is really, really extensible. Like, like ridiculously extensible. People say, oh yeah, but it's tight coupling and blah, blah, blah. It's rubbish. (laughs) You know, you can include plugins, you can include third party libraries, uh, you can build your own uh, components to, you know, extend functionality and, and, and uh, share functionality between controllers. Uh, You can build out, you know, behaviors and share them with the rest of the community. Um, There's uh, the, the plugin structure. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but the plugin is like a mini cake PHP app. The the structure of a plugin is is like you're adding a little application to, cool. to cake PHP. So I mean, the the extensibility of it is really really extensive, and uh, I think it's it's definitely one of the winning features for cake, especially when you're building internally. If you're a company, you want to reuse as much as possible. You want to cut down on the development that you're doing, you know, from one project to the next. And KPHP is really in line with that. If you're building tools internally and certain functionality, which is really common between projects, you know, usually you have a, a common profile between clients. Uh, you know, you, you really do cut down on development in the long run. And you can even split out, can't you, and reuse the same version of KPHP across a multiple, like you've got the three kind of, you know, where the web route is, where the application is, and where the actual framework is yeah and, it's a and, nice it, easy it's way of- yeah and it allows you to configure that as well so i mean you can have like a single core uh serving multiple applications uh you can you know define where you want your core stored you can you know store your temp files somewhere you can even load plugins from a different location that's cool want. so it, there, there is some, there's real thought but behind you know how kphp is configurable you know to a certain extent it, i mean the, the framework is more about convention over configuration uh, but, you know, some things just are configurable. You can't make a convention about where the temp file goes. With uh, 3, what's the ETA on that? Is there like a, a massive release date that you're thinking or is really is it kind of when it gets re- when it's ready, when it's that stable? Well, we have our annual conference coming up. Um, it's being hosted in Madrid, Spain this year. 
uh, from the 21st to the 24th of August. Uh, so that is kind of our window of opportunity. Ooh, That's what we're very getting. nice. It's very close. Uh, bear in mind, we've already got an alpha out. Uh, so we're definitely, you know, heading down the, the path to getting to you know, beta and release candidates. Um, if the actual stable version doesn't land for Cakefest, it's going to be very shortly after. So I, I've got to be honest with you, I've never been to uh, one of these events like Laricon or Cakefest, but I, how uh, how much would you uh, recommend it to anyone who's like listening? I mean, what what's the kind of stuff that someone will get out of it, I guess? Well, it's a four-day conference, um, and it's broken into two sections. So the first two days are dedicated to workshops. Um, so basically, we have core developers on the gr- on the floor, uh, you know, showing people KPHP, and with it, there's there's a session which is going through all day for the two days. Um, so we're showing people certain areas of the framework, how to get working with it, and we have a mixed crowd. So we have people who have never touched KPHP to people who really know KPHP. Uh, so we break sort of sessions up into basic sessions and then more advanced sessions. Um, but usually those two days, if you're going for the uh, technical side of the conference, you know, you know, walking away with, you know, some code or some really great ideas, then those two days are really good. And we, we break the tickets up as well. So you can take the first two days, you can take the second two days, or you can take all four. Um, the, that's the Thursday and the Friday, which is 21st and 22nd. 23rd and the 24th are then the conference. So the, the conference is basically we have speakers. So we've got a really great lineup of uh, speakers this year. Um, we have uh, some activities like uh, core team Q and A. Uh, people AC ask us questions and totally troll us. Um, we have <laughs> l- lightning talks uh, where we allow people to have a go at speaking who are you know a little bit nervous or they're not used to you know speaking at an event. That's a great um, idea. Yeah. We have something called the hour of contribution, uh, where we spend an hour introducing everybody at the conference to open source. So showing people, okay, this is how you get involved with the project. Uh, this is the kind of process and the workflow you can expect and how you would go through it. Uh, this is how you do a pull request. This is some basic things on how you use Git. Uh, so introducing people into how they can actually get involved with the project. Um, we also have a raffle and then there's cake, real Yay. cake. <laughs> <laughs> it would not right. be complete without real cake. No. And this year we got a great offer because we got tickets, which actually include the hotel. Oh, wow. uh, so you can wow. just buy the ticket and all you got to do is show up. Oh, that sounds awesome. I actually want to be there now. That sounds awesome. <laughs> if I didn't have a baby too on the 5th of August, I'd be there. But, uh, yeah, that sounds really cool. And, uh, there's a, you've got a book coming out as well. Am I right in saying that? Yeah. Uh, we got a, the title is the KPHP2 application cookbook. Uh, it's being published by Pact Publishing. Uh, that'll probably be available around August, sort of, sort of cake fest time. Uh, if it doesn't land for Cakefest, it'll be, you know, like, like Cake 3, it'll probably be, you know, just really shortly after the event. Yeah. Um, it's a cookbook for KPHP. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of puns uh, with KPHP. <laughs> <in it. laughs> yeah. um, so it's a collection of recipes, uh, or tutorials for common tasks with, uh, KPHP. So basically we took Stack Overflow, uh, and some support sites, sites which are out and about, and we ranked the most popular questions up oh, and oh, yeah. covered the most common issues that people are having with the framework. That is yeah. cool. I, I so, and I co author this book with Jose, Jorge Gonzalez, who's the official KPHP trainer, and he does the official KPHP training and the basic workshops at KFIT. So, you know, he's, he's really out there as well. So, you've got a busy uh, month next month then? I have a busy month every month. <laughs> I, I, I don't stop. I'm, I do five things at once. Wow. Everything's happening. I don't know how to have a baby Yeah, that's going to change things for you. What, what, what got you into writing a book? Like the process of it? So how long does it, how long has it taken to kind of write the book? Um, we were told by the publishers that a book, the work on a book, so to go from, you know, idea to publication is usually around about six to eight months, uh, depending on the person's availability, depending on their experience writing content. Uh, we actually wrote this one, I think in five weeks. Wow. Wow. So that is an amazing we're really, turnover. Yeah. We're really well versed with the content. So it wasn't like a big deal for us. And we were kind of balancing it out with the, you know, our, our day jobs and everything at KDC. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely got this one done quicker than expected. That is amazing. That wow. Is cool. But and that just shows it came so fluently. Like you say, you knew the, the code inside out. So you didn't have to get bogged down with research or anything like that. You could literally just pour out. Your yeah, well, voice. we had we had a good guide because obviously having the the questions on Stack Overflow, we knew yeah. the they knew the problems the, of what people were having. Yeah, we knew the areas we had to we had to attack. The, to be honest with you, the biggest issue for me was the actual content. So not not so much the the tutorial, yeah. but writing fluent English. 
you know, and making yeah. it sound good and, and not repeating yourself. Making so, it flow. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and you get into this kind of, you know, repeated kind of thing where it does everything sounds the same. Yeah. And, and I guess who to aim it at, aim it at uh, someone who's never touched code before or, or, you know, to a season pro getting that balance well, right, I guess. Well, the problem we have with cake, I mean, I say it's a problem. It's, it's the situation yeah. that we have with cake because the framework has such a low barrier to entry. Yeah. You get people using the framework who, who almost don't know how to program. They know the, they the absolute minimum. KP3 allows them to do stuff, but they do get into a situation where they, they, they get into some domain logic or, you know, some, some business requirements for an application and then they kind of get stuck because, yeah. you know, oh, I have to do something now. I'm going to use it's not a, a wild. simple crud thing that you can, uh. Yeah. No, I'm going to use a wild and I'll never break out of it. Yeah. You know, well, let's see how that goes. <laughs> oh, dear. It's honestly like the one thing that comes up every single podcast is that whole, you know, how much do they need to know before they can use something? And I don't think we'll ever get an answer to that question, but it's. Right, but the problem is, is how do you, how do you gauge that? I mean, cause if I'm going to ask someone if they really know PHP, I'll probably ask them, okay, do you have Zen certification? Cause that's sort of some orientation that's as to you know, how yep. much do you know? Yeah. But for like the lower ranking, you know, do you know certain stuff? There really isn't anything. And a lot of people come at you with, oh, I did this online course with, you know, so and so, you know, well, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, and it's not yeah. really backed by anyone. So. Uh, one well, question. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go for it, man. I was say one question. Uh, the, uh, how is it being an event organizer for a, a really large <laughs> open source project? I just think it must be a nightmare. <laughs> uh, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <that's> it. <laughs> I'm going to take that work, you, those words. Oh. If you, if you get the offer, just run. Just say no. <laughs> don't look no. back. <laughs> no, I mean, what's it like? So first of all, it's very difficult. Uh, and it's difficult because when you organize a conference, and I, I, I can't speak for other people because I'm pretty sure that other people are really good at organizing conferences and it's just because I'm really bad at it. Um, it's, it just feels like a constant uphill battle and it's a constant moving target. Yes. Yeah, so, so many variables in there. Yeah. You, d- you don't know, it, for example, the cost of the conference. There is usually a defined cost. There are some variable costs, like if you're going to be covering costs for speakers or if you're going to be doing some uh, stuff like, you know, paying for certain people's flights. Uh, you know, on the core team or whatever, so they can get to the event. Um, you know, covering things which are tangible because you don't know exactly how much it's going to cost. And I mean, most people are good, but some people sort of leave their flights until the last minute or something. And then, you know, oh, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, and, uh, it, it adds to the, that invariable nature of how much is this thing going to cost? So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is the people problem. So organizing people. You have to contact a lot of people. I, I spend like, I think last year I actually did a calculation out of curiosity and I'd sent something like 250 emails just to sponsors. Wow. So just, just negotiation with sponsors. You know, how do you want to get involved? How, how can we help you get involved? You know, these are the options available. This is what we're doing. And then all the questions which sort of, you know, come back at you all the time. Okay. Well, we've noticed that you're doing this, but are you doing that? And could we do this? And could we do that? And can we have that for free? And if we pay a little bit less, can we have that? You know, everything's what well, you're basically asking for people to money. So, you know, there's going to be some negotiation. Yeah. Um, this year we've been really lucky last year as well. We got a really great lineup of sponsors. Um, but that's very tedious as well. Uh, you then have the, the process that you go through. So you, you start your call for papers and then you have people submitting their papers and you have people contacting you. Hey, I submitted my talk. What did you think of it? You know, can we talk about it? Um, you know, I have like 600 people on Facebook and I don't know who they are, <laughs> but they just talk to me all day. Every, every day they're asking me stuff. And, you know, I have like this threshold of how much I can actually do in a day, you know, without going over that threshold and sort of interfering with like my personal life or my wife getting really pissed at me. Um, <laughs> Amen. So you have to have a really strict control over how you do things. So setting up like a really strict schedule, uh, setting up uh, certain dates for doing things, making sure that there's a clear path to how you're getting to the final point, which is the conference itself. Um, but tracking all of that is painful as well. So, you know, following up with people, you talk to, like I mentioned, sponsor, you'll send out an email to a sponsor and they reply the next day. Then you send an email back and after two weeks, you've had nothing. So there's that constant chasing of, you know, seeing if, you know, something's getting done, if something's going to happen, if something's going to come of it. Then you have the speakers and you have the, we have a uh, voting on, you know, who's going to give the talks and stuff like that. This, this year has been pretty good because we have some really great people submitting talks. Um, Phil Sturgeon's going to be there. There you go. Stalking again. <laughs> um, but we, we, you have to sort of, you know, follow up with them, make sure, you know, they're happy with everything, make sure everything's understood, that everything's going through the process and, you know, they're going to show up and, you know, then maybe they need an extra day at the hotel or, you know, whatever. So all of this stuff isn't something you can account for. 
I do not know how much time it's going to take me to talk to certain people. I don't know if there's going to be more or less, you know, inquiries about something. I don't know if something's going to blow up or something's going to go wrong or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's that sort of waking up in, in the morning and being completely uncertain as to whether everything's going to go fine today or if you're going to have like five emails of people having problems. A massive yeah. cluster. Um, oh, damn. And that's, we haven't even started the event yet. Yeah. That's just yeah. organizing that's the organized. event. Then when you get to the event, you have the the people situation, but in a in a different sense of so the people being there. So you know, people coming up to you and saying, "Hey, you know, where are the toilets?" Or you know, "How can I do this?" Or "How can I do that?" Or "Does somebody have a virtual machine for whatever?" Uh, you know, so there's this this constant of you know being tagged at. You know, of, you know, I, I want to have something or I want to do something. Uh, and you know, I've I, I'm luckily this year I'm only doing the keynote, uh, but last year I did the keynote and I had uh, talks as well. So it was it was pretty stressful. And then all the stuff like you know the cake, you know, you're thinking all this time, you <laughs> know, it, you've got to get fridge. a cake. You're, you're gonna pull the cake out and that cake's gonna have melted or something, right? And that's oh, gonna man. be. And then obviously the bakers don't work on the weekend, so all of these things just add up. And you know, and that's probably why people drink a lot. <laughs> you know, because yeah. <laughs> alcohol solves these problems. Yeah, it's just like at its own numb now. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear so you've sold it so oh, yeah brilliant i'm, I'm definitely going to consider that you know you're going to have a baby and you're going to organize a conference <laughs> well i'm just thinking yeah where the satisfaction i take it comes after at the end of the event and you think wow pulled it off uh people go away inspired and you feel like you've made a difference i guess yeah i mean that's that's probably the it's the most heartwarming moment so at the end yeah. of the event people walking up to you shaking your hand and saying thank you yeah, you know, yeah. thank you for organizing this i've had a really great time i've, I've you know i've picked up so much stuff you know and i'm gonna you know I, i'm gonna get home now and i'm gonna you know turn on a laptop and i'm gonna start working on some of these projects because i've been talking to so-and-so about doing something or so-and-so about another thing you know the the networking opportunity at the conference is really really strong because the kind of developers who show up are like really you know they good care. that's it developers. that's it they care yeah and then the real people like behind the project i don't want to put anyone down because everyone's you know helping out how they can but the people who show up at the event are kind of like the people who are on the front line yeah. They're the people who are really supporting. And, you know, some people can't make it because of, you know, financial, you know, worries or whatever. Uh, but, you know, the people who can show up and they show their support, you know, it's just, it's an amazing feeling because you, it's not, there's no company behind it. It's, it's not like Microsoft and they just throw, you know, oh, here's $200,000. That's go, it. You know, set up a company. Yeah. Do something, you know. You know, it's kind of happened out of inspiration, out of people getting together and doing something. And, you know, that's, that's really, really great. So I've how, got to be, a, oh, sorry, Ed, go on. So how many conferences have you actually organized then in total? Uh, I organized this one. I organized last year and I, I handled some of the stuff on 2012 because the person who was handled 2012 couldn't actually make it to the event. Um, so I wasn't involved with the running up, but I did kind of handle everything at the event. And that was kind of me being thrown in the deep end. I never, been, yeah, that must have been really <sighs> stressful. That was, I mean, I like, I, I got up to my room sort of after like a day you know, handling the, the conference and everything, I would just pass out. Oh, man. <laughs> and I didn't make breakfast any of the days of the conference. Wow. Uh, I had a question, which has completely left my head now. But, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, actually, it was more an observation that, I mean, your contribution to the open source community makes me feel shockingly bad because it's just <laughs> overwhelming. And I often hide behind the excuse that I'm married, I've got a full-time job, I've got a baby on the way. And you've got all those things and you still manage to do that. That's just incredible. I don't know how you do it. I really don't. It definitely puts strain on your personal life. So, yeah. I mean, I think this is the side of open source that people don't see. Uh, there's a lot of dedication. There's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people helping. Um, yeah. There's a lot of people who, you know, dedicate their time. There are other people who have, you know, financial interest, which is cool as well. Yeah. Um, but when you, it's like with, you know, like I was saying about my wife, you know, when other pregnant, you know, people, women have children, you kind of give a little look. Yeah. You, you, when you know or talk to somebody else who's really involved in open source, there's kind of like this understanding. You know, yeah. I understand the late nights you've had. Yeah. I understand the overwhelming inbox. I understand, you know, everybody, you know, wanting, you know, a piece or every, everybody wanting to get involved or all these great ideas that get pitched at you and you just know you don't have the time to do them, but you know, they would be really great. You know, there's, it's just, it's like a reality that, that you kind of know. And it's like that, that head nod, right? The wink. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Well, I suppose, guys, we have got over the hour mark and you're, James, you've been one of those guests that I know me and I could just talk to you for hours on end and, uh, and still probably not have covered everything. But we, I, we've not even touched on some of the other open source projects that you've been involved in. But obviously, we have got uh, links to all those, which we'll include in the show notes for sure, sure. Um, as well as 
you know, several video links, um, and including your keynote speech from last year's conference. So, uh, I'll, I'll definitely be watching that this week as well. So, um, uh, did you have any final questions you wanted to ask Ed before we, uh, we leave James alone? Um, not, not a kind of question more just, yeah, I say that. Thank you for coming on the show and like kind yeah. of yeah, giving up your time for it. And yeah, it's really interesting. Your kind of views on like, you know, event organizing and the, yeah, the, the direction that cake PHP is going in and wants to go in is yeah, really kind of awesome. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I guess, I guess the last thing I want to say was really, uh, for anyone here's listening and, uh, uh, obviously we don't really show any bias when it comes to frameworks or anything like that because we have obviously have a lot of other people come on the show and talk about their frameworks but all i would say is to anyone listening don't just try one framework um give them all a go because you, you don't know until you try it you exactly. have no idea you just exactly. start people's views on things and yeah and i think perhaps maybe there's like a misconception that because a lot of these frameworks use the uh the mvc design pattern that they maybe they're all the same which is a complete fallacy so Give them all a go and cause you, you should find one that, that suits you and meets your requirements the, the best. So give it a good go. And, and cake certainly looks like a great framework to me. So check it out. Cool. Well, thanks again, James. Really appreciate you uh, coming on and sparing your, uh, giving your free time up to uh, talk to us about all this, uh, about cake and all uh, your book and cake fest. Um, sure. No, thank you guys. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening guys. Right. See you later, people. Bye. You've been listening to Three Devs and a Maybe. You can contact us at contact at three devs and a maybe dot com or follow us on Twitter at the number three devs and a maybe. <laughs>